Coming up, sweet tooth. Have you ever wondered why you crave something sweet? We'll take a look at the science behind those cravings. Then, NBA champion Kevin Love is on a mission to raise awareness about mental health and help kids and grown-ups understand if they're struggling, they are not alone. You have so many more people in your corner than you think. Speak your truth. Also ahead, puffins. It's hard to look away from these adorable seabirds. Just what makes puffins so unique? We'll explain. Plus, the gift of giving. These students from one school in Harlem are giving back this holiday season. Sometimes people have to take matters into their own hands and become the Santa for them. Well, we're basically like mini Santa's. And paw submission. Meet Cole, a therapy dog, making a difference by being different. This is NBC Nightly News Kids Edition. Welcome back to Nightly News Kids Edition. It's always great to be with you guys, especially on a weekend morning. We've got a super lineup ahead. Cole, the 2022 American Humane Hero Therapy Dog, will be here. Plus, we'll introduce you to this double Dutch team and tell you a little bit about the sport and how it got a jump start, if you will. But let's begin with something many of you probably enjoy, sweets. Whether it's your favorite breakfast cereal or a must-have dessert, many kids and grown-ups often crave something something sweet to eat, but why? What's going on that makes us want sweet so badly? Our pal, Dr. John Torres, takes a look at the science behind a sweet tooth. A sweet tooth, it's not a specific tooth in your mouth. In fact, it has nothing to do with your actual teeth. Having a sweet tooth simply means that you're a big fan of sweet foods and often crave them. This is a combination of your body and your brain telling you that you want sugar. And what's even trickier, the more you eat sweets, well, the more you end up craving them. A lot of people have a sweet tooth, and that isn't necessarily a bad thing, but you wanna be aware of it and not let it make all your decisions. I have a big, big sweet tooth I have all my life. So here are some tips that I use that might help you. If I'm craving something sweet, I try reaching for healthier sweet foods, like fruits or yogurt, instead of candy or ice cream. Also, be aware of where sugar hides. One sneaky spot? Well, drinks like juice and soda, so try to stick with water and milk most of the time. And eat and drink slowly. This way, you can satisfy that sweet craving, but consume a bit less sugar. Most importantly, moderation is key. This doesn't mean you can never have chocolate or cookies, because where's the fun in that? But you do want to be aware of how much sugar you're eating and make sure you're eating other foods to get the vitamins and proteins you need to stay healthy. On the opposite end of the spectrum, some people crave salty foods like potato chips. And the same tips work here. Try to reach for healthier options like peanuts or pretzels and be mindful of how much salt you're actually eating. And remember, whether it's sweet or salty, for the most part, it's all okay in moderation. Dr. John Torres, thanks so much. Is it wrong that I want a piece of licorice right now? <laughs> Sorry. Well, we know we spend a good amount of time on this program talking about how to take care of our bodies physically, but our minds also need to be taken care of. And one NBA star is on a mission to make sure kids know they are not alone and can recognize the signs of anxiety or other potential mental health problems. Kids, you may want to grab a parent or grown-up to watch in case you have questions. Kevin Love is a champion on the basketball court, but it's what the Cleveland Cavaliers forward is doing off the court that he hopes will make a lasting difference. I feel like people scan their body and they think, well, you know, what does their body need? And while I think that's great, I think you also need to think about what's in between the ears. Mental health is part of Love's game plan. He wants kids and grown-ups to know it's okay to not feel okay all the time. Understanding that everybody's fighting a battle that we can't see. The NBA star suffers from anxiety and panic attacks. For me, I sweat. <laughs> my heart rate really elevates, my breathing elevates. It's like the feeling of being in a permanent elevator. I know for a fact everybody's experience is, is different. After finally getting help and speaking openly about his mental health struggles, Love is on a full court press to pay it forward. More than anything, it was about paying it forward and helping that next person. The Kevin Love Fund just launched a social and emotional learning program available to middle, high school, and college students 
giving kids a safe place in the classroom to share their feelings. Hi, I'm Chris Paul. For this lesson, I would like to talk to you guys about random acts of kindness. So the Kevin Love Fund Social Emotional Learning Curriculum is a really highly engaging and fun way to learn about emotion and to start to feel comfortable expressing some of those difficult life experiences and emotions that students maybe haven't talked about before. Like Kevin, I have a lot of sleep anxiety. During the nighttime, it really uh, starts to come with me. And then I also have OCD which is obsessive compulsive disorder. For kids like 14-year-old Ian Ludwig, the program has had a positive impact. For me, participating in these different sessions, I was able to pull out that writing is a big escape for me and that I, one of my uh, coping mechanisms is um, to uh, write. It's really helpful because everyone copes in their own way. We'd love it if you... In addition to the curriculum, Kevin Love and his organization held a teen mental health summit in October, training teens to be peer ambassadors like Ian. When you talk about it, for me at least, when I talk about my different struggles, it actually makes me feel better. You know, those people that have their jerseys up in the stands. Love says kids should know they are not alone. It's normal to feel that way. And for whatever reason, it's, it hasn't been in the past normal to, to speak about it. You have so many more people in your corner than you think. Speak your truth. And speaking of truth, we asked Kevin Love to answer some of your questions. Hi Kevin, my name is Emma, and I do competition gymnastics. What's your secret for staying calm before a big game? Thanks! First of all, I could never in my life wrap my head around how nerve-wracking gymnastics are. For staying calm before a big game, I think it's just, um, you know, making sure that my body is, is feeling right. All the stretching, but another thing that I do a lot is like meditation, and sometimes I can just be breathing as well. I think that clears your mind. How do you get past the pregame jitters? For me, it's all preparation, right? You know, on the way to the game, I listen to soft, soothing music, or like instrumentals that have no words, but also like on the way to the game, uh, I make sure that my heart rate's down, I'm calm. Hi, Mr. Love, this is Sebastian. What would you advise kids who are under a lot of stress playing sports? Give it your all. You know, you, I think the biggest thing you, you can walk away with is knowing that, you know, you gave it all on the field of play. Kevin Love, giving it his all and inspiring others to take care of their bodies and their minds. All right, Kevin, it is so great what you're doing. Thanks so much. Well, let's turn now to our Inspiring Kids series. Students at one elementary school here in New York City are incredibly passionate about giving back to their community, especially around the holidays. Let's get details now from our good friend Hoda Kotb. Hi, I'm here to collect toys for the toy drive. The spirit of giving echoes through the hallways of Kip Star Harlem Elementary in New York City. We have so many toys. Students from kindergarten to fourth grade are devoted to giving back to their community. Not just this holiday season, but year-round. It all started with a simple sock drive called Socktober. Their goal was to collect 1,000 pairs for community shelters. But a fire had ignited within them, and they beat their goal by nearly tenfold. We brought in. Principal Brandy Vardaman says she was blown away. The kids taught me a lot about raising my bar. They also taught me about just this idea that you're never too young to understand what it means to help someone else. The kids kept the donations going with a Thanksgiving food drive and now a holiday toy drive, proving even the tiniest helper can make the biggest impact. You know what I love about your school? What? You guys give back. Tell me why it's important to give back. A lot of people are less fortunate than we are nowadays, so giving them back makes me feel like they have been loved by someone. It's no fear here if we don't give back, they don't get anything, but if we give them stuff, they get stuff. And we want the world to be fair so everybody could have the same life as us. Wow, you guys have such big hearts. You know, a lot of kids are concentrating on what they get. 
they're thinking about, I want Santa to bring me this and this. But you guys are talking about what you're going to give. Sometimes people have to take matters into their own hands and become the Santa for them. Well, we're basically like mini Santas also. You're mini Santas? Yes. <gasps> Do you guys have a good team? Yes. Do you have a great team? Yeah. Someone tell me how many toys you have collected so far. At least 20 to 30 toys. Yeah. Should we go check on that toy drive? Yeah. yeah. The kids have no idea that Santa's elves work their holiday magic. Come on in, come on in. Macy's and Toys R Us donated 500 toys. And now you can give these away to kids who are in need. This is awesome. Meanwhile, just down the hall, the entire student body is gathered for what may be their most memorable school assembly yet. You know what? <laughs> Macy's and Toys R Us is giving every single student a holiday present. A joyous celebration of the season of giving with children who live it every single day. All right, Hoda, thanks very much. That story certainly puts me in the holiday spirit. Well, speaking of the holidays, time for our pop quiz. The question this week, who was the author of A Christmas Carol? Was it A, Charles Dickens, B, Theodore Dr. Seuss Geisel, or C, Brothers Grimm? We'll have the answer coming up after the break. And just ahead, they're sometimes called parrots of the sea. Find out what makes puffins so special. Plus, meet Cole, a therapy dog who is helping kids understand that it's perfectly okay to be different. And learning the ropes. One double Dutch team is inspiring America with more than just their jumps, tricks, and turns. We'll introduce you to Jump for Jerry when we return. All right, welcome back to Nightly News Kids Edition. Let's get the answer to our pop quiz. The question, who was the author of A Christmas Carol? A, Charles Dickens, B, Theodore Dr. Seuss Geisel, or C, Brothers Grimm? The answer is A, Charles Dickens. Did you know A Christmas Carol was first published back in 1843 and became an instant bestseller and remains today one of the most popular holiday stories of all time, inspiring movies, stage, and TV productions? Well, let's head now to Maine, where one seabird is making a comeback, the puffin. Our pal Carrie Sanders has the story. This is the story of the adorable Atlantic puffin. Its rainbow-colored beak in sharp contrast to its black and white feathers. The puffin had become so prized at one point, the birds were almost lost to extinction. We had a chance to visit Eastern Egg Rock Island in the Gulf of Maine over the summer for an up-close look at these fascinating seabirds. So this is incredibly active here, what are we seeing? We have common terns and arctic terns. Adult puffins. It's hard to look away. Because humans hunted them for food and their feathers, these captivating creatures disappeared from the island for nearly a hundred years. But thanks to the hard work of scientists, they're making a comeback. I don't know whether it's just me. I look at a puffin and I kind of want to giggle. I mean, it looks like it's a, a toucan and maybe a penguin. It is not just you. Almost everyone finds puffins adorable, really intriguing, fascinating. Even me, I'm a data-driven scientist, but I love looking at puffins. Today, there are between three and four million of these clever birds in the whole world. More than half of them live in Iceland in the North Atlantic Ocean. But this island is one of the southernmost homes for the puffins and their newborn chicks. Did you know adult Atlantic puffins weigh about the same as a can of soda and can fly up to 55 miles per hour? That's highway speed. Puffins spend most of their life at sea, bobbing around on the ocean like a cork. And guess what? They can swim underwater for as long as a minute. 
they fly underwater. They use their wings to propel themselves both in the air when they're flying and when they're swimming underwater. And they're chasing the fish? They chase down fish and grab them with that impressive bill. Puffins eat fish, lots of them. Their beaks are specially designed so they can carry as many as 10 at the same time, and sometimes way more. And unlike humans, puffins can drink salt water. They have a special way of separating the salt from the water in their bodies, so they never get thirsty out on the ocean. What do we have here? This is actually a baby puffling. Um, puffling. Yes. Puffins usually lay just one egg per year. To keep the eggs safe and warm, adult puffins dig long burrows using their beaks. And when the babies are born, they're called Pufflings. Pufflings are super cute, and they need about six weeks to grow up before they can fly away from their nest. Because of their colorful beaks, puffins are sometimes called sea parrots. But for scientists, they're more than just small birds with a big personality. They are messengers of what's happening at sea. And what happens at sea affects not just puffins, but people and everything on this planet. Feathered friends worth fighting for. All right, Kerry, thanks so much. Well, it is a sport that has been around for decades. It's called Double Dutch. And there's one young team from New Jersey that is inspiring America beyond the ropes. We get details now from our good friend, Kristen Dahlgren. Timing is key when it comes to Double Dutch. I like to do double dutch tricks, cartwheels, and push-ups. Two ropes turning in opposite directions at the same time. The hardest part is just trying to get in the rope, because most people get scared of getting hit on the rope. Being here is really fun. You just got to take your time and be patient. Cool, fun, a lot of work. Here inside this Jersey City Community Center, these kids are quite literally learning the ropes and a whole lot more. My goal is to provide a safe haven, some place the children can come, feel comfortable. Kimberly Princella started the nonprofit Jump for Jerry a few years ago after her son was fatally hit by a car. Jerry was just eight. He loved to double dutch. He loved to double dutch. He was very competitive. Now the mother and teacher is honoring her son, Jerry, the best way she knows how. We honor Jerry legacy by enabling children of different ages, different background, to build life skills, confidence, strong character, and to realize their potential as leaders. That helps me sleep at night. That's how I honor my baby legacy. One, two, three. It's like my second family. It's more of a family. It's a safe zone. I like to jump because it's fun. And I like to meet new people. Did you know Double Dutch started in the streets? But in 1971, New York City police officer David Walker turned Double Dutch into a national sport. And the rest, as they say, is history. We're going to have an amazing show today. The 31st annual holiday classic just took place at the famed Apollo Theater in Harlem. It's an international double dutch event. These kids understand the importance of the culture of being a part of the event. On hand for the international competition, Jump for Jerry. It's great to see these kids today still staying active and doing activity and jumping a sport and being passionate about it. Passionate they certainly are. And in case you're wondering what's the hardest part of double dutch? Turning. Anybody could jump, but you gotta have turners to jump. You gotta keep the rope on the floor. You gotta make sure you turn your jumpers. Speed. And don't forget to lace up. Both have to keep them double tied. A sport building confidence. It's fun and you get a lot of workout from it. And you should try it. And a team hoping to inspire other kids to jump a little higher in life. How does it make you feel? Happy. In fact, because it's fun. Try it, like express yourself and open up to new things. It's not that hard. Kristen, thanks so much. Finally, a story about one dog and his owner who are teaching others about acceptance, love, and how it's okay to be different. Here with more, our friend Aaron McLaughlin. 
Cole has a gift and loves to share it. <laughs> He's gonna give them his time, his devotion. Cole is a therapy dog who happens to be deaf, showing kids and grown-ups that it's okay to be different. A disability is not an inability. We want people to realize that just because something was born a little bit different, it doesn't mean they're not as amazing as anything else, if not more so. Chris Hanna adopted the pit bull mix from an animal shelter. I'll never forget the day that I met Cole. There was a man in the waiting room with his family, and he, he said the dog was broken. Why would I want to adopt him? And at the time, it angered me. But now I want to say thank you to the man because that one word set forth a life mission. Cole may have been born without the ability to hear, but that hasn't stopped him from making a difference. Like at the schools, including the one where Chris teaches in New Jersey. When students are interacting with Cole, I truly believe that they then at that time realize that they have a hero. They have something or someone that is there for them. And when he's not at school, Cole spends time with Veterans Weekly. I had taken him in the very first time and they sparked up. And the, all the workers, were, the nurses and the activities people are saying the same thing. We've never seen them so like happy and kind of uplifted. Cole even bowls with the veterans. I think his high score is 172. What this little dog is able to do for those veterans, that's pretty powerful. Cole was just named the 2022 American Humane Hero Therapy Dog. Chris acknowledges the challenges with this kind of breed and the public perception, but says this is one more thing Cole is teaching, tolerance. I think the, the biggest thing is he's showing not just my students at school, but the veterans at the veterans home that there is somebody or something that cares for them that is not going to judge them on anything is there unconditionally, literally unconditionally. Aaron, thanks so much. And look who's here joining us now in our studio, Chris Hanna and Cole. Chris, thanks for coming on. Thank you for this, having this us. This is real neat. And as we said, uh, Cole was just named the Hero Therapy Dog of 2022. Did it take a lot of time to, to train Cole to be able to help others? It did. Um, it was a dedication. We spent hundreds of hours um, from the time we started with his training to get his therapy certifications. Um, but he was such a joy and a pleasure to work with and create such a, a very unique and special bond. I mentioned to you a moment ago, his eyes are so engaging. He gives you those puppy dog eyes, right? How do the students react when, when they meet Cole for the first time? It's fun to watch barriers just come down. Right. They become themselves, they become who they are, and any inhibitions or any kind of emotions that they were feeling instantly change when they lay eyes on on that special little Well, guy. and that leads to my question. What do you hope that kids and grown-ups will take away from interacting with Cole? With the struggles of his breed and being born deaf, we've had to face a lot of adversities and as uh, we always tell our students that a disability is not an inability, it's a superpower in Cole's case. So each person can really find their own superpower. And just because there's something a little bit different about you, that's what makes you unique. That's what makes you special. And looking through the, the lens of Cole's eyes, kids are really grasping onto that concept. And so when Cole is not busy working, because he's, I guess, a working dog, what's he like to do? He likes to kayak. Um, oh, really? He does. He sits in between my feet or in the back of the kayak as we kind of go. Um, he loves to visit a lot of pet stores where he gets spoiled like crazy. Um, loves to play ball and loves destroying stuffed animals. <laughs> and, I, and I love all the sayings on his vest here. It's uh, uh, My favorite is uh, happiness ambassador. That he certainly which is. Which is a great one. Well, Chris, thanks so much for bringing Cole on. It's really great to have the both of you here, and it's really, really important work you're doing. Thank you so together. much. It's great. Well, that's going to do it for us. Parents, just a reminder, if your child has a question about any topic in the news, email a video to us at nightlynewskids at nbcuni.com, and we'll try to answer them in an upcoming episode. You can also follow us on Instagram at nightlykids. And just a program note, you can catch a new episode of Nightly News Kids Edition every Thursday on NBCNews.com and YouTube and streaming on the weekends on NBC News Now. Thanks for watching, everyone. Remember to take care of yourself and each other. So long.